Welcome to Media Agrafra Online, the show that helps you navigate the ever-changing video world. I'm Christopher Michael McHugh, as always, with our friend TV's Phil Capello. This episode, we're joined by John Leland from Combridges, coming to us from the Golden State, home of the soon-to-be NBA championship, Golden State Warriors. Go Warriors! Well, actually, you got that right, man. <laughs> actually, I don't even know anything about sports, really. Uh, John just told me to say that, so I did. John's not only the new media innovator, author, speaker, he's the uh, founding director of Creative Services uh, back in the day over at USA Network, back when narrowcast cable networks like CNN, MTV, ESPN were a brand new thing. Well, John, as you know, big news for the cord-cutting world, at least in the Northeast, uh, here cable provider Cablevision created so-called cord cutter package, basically giving customers high-speed internet pair of rabbit ears, what are those, and the option for the new HBO with the freestanding service. So, John, what do you think about this package? Is this attractive to anybody? Not really. I, don't, I mean, maybe some people, but I basically look at it as an act of desperation. I mean, not that it's not without any merit, but I have to say that, you know, people that are cord cutting, people that are being really independent on the web, uh, and watching, you know, becoming more dependent, for example, on Netflix. I mean, they can already get it through a smart TV. They can al already get it through Apple TV, Roku, and any, uh, you know, video game units, etc. So um, their cable vision is trying to get in the game and trying not to get shut out. But um, they're really playing catch up. And, you know, my, my position is that a lot of the cable companies have lost so much credibility with how price inflated these bundles are that why would somebody that wakes up to the fact that they really can get all their entertainment via streaming and, and via a Wi-Fi internet connection want to do business with a cable company? Yeah, exactly. And uh, some of these cable companies, I think it was uh, Comcast, I want to say, you could, uh, or, or Time Warner, one of the two, you could actually use your Roku box as another cable box. And my I mean, that's the point where using your Roku box, or like I use an iTV, I point over my shoulder because I have my little antenna and my, my TV over there, which is my computer. I mean, that seems to be the future. When I first looked at this package, I, I literally took a second look at it. It said 50 and up or ultra 50 or whatever, and I thought they were going to say, oh, we're giving you 50 channels. You know, and it was going to be trying to compete with either Roku, go directly with Hulu, and it wasn't at all. It was just, you know, 50 gigabytes or whatever their price structuring was. And the fact that they're mailing you a, a $27 RCA or whatever it is antenna and calling it rabbit ears, not even you giving you enough respect to think that a cord cutter understands it's a digital signal and their sub channels. I mean, I'm one of these people that cut the cord a long time ago and is using the system, and it's basically them telling you they're giving you broadband internet. It's just another way of packaging broadband internet. It doesn't seem to be integrated with any sort of video. Um, well, with a little, a little bit, a little bit of digital TV. I mean, that's the point of the rabbit ears is that you could get local broadcast, right? And I that, mean, that's know. the point. But as a user of digital TV, I use digital TV the way anybody else uses cable TV, integrated with the DVR, with a channel guide. All these things are available, and so it seemed to me it was like they took the cheapest way in that anybody can get this stuff a la carte at Radio Shack. And what all they're really providing is the same thing they've always provided, which is broadband internet. So it didn't seem like much of a package for me. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, and we're obviously a, a more sophisticated market, and we understand this stuff. I mean, where I think they're trying to make some money is, you know, no offense to little old ladies, but, you know, people that don't necessarily understand the technology very well, and they go, oh, Cablevision is going to give me this bundle, and I could be cool and maybe save a couple bucks. I mean, the real bottom line here is that the cable companies have been overcharging. I, you know, the issue that I have is, and it's funny because it refers to the Warriors also because I'm a golf fan, is that I, I, I can't get the live sports via the Internet that I would like to get. You know, and those rabbit ears, you know, the one instance where they would be useful for me, for me anyway, is, you know, now the NBA playoffs are going on ABC, they're off of TNT and all that. I think it's ABC, whoever it is, the, the network coverage is now switching in. And, you know, I can't get my regional sports network. 
I mean, I the, well, Chris we, and we've I, got we've great talked, local broadcasters, and you know, I can't get those people without a cable connection. Chris and I have talked a, a ton about that, but for me, the answer is more rabbit. I mean, if you want to call them rabbit ears, but more rabbit ears. But if you're going to get a little old lady to use it, you actually need to give her a package that's all in one. I mean, I always say we were last week we we're talking about there's been some legislation in Indiana trying to get the chips that exist in every cell phone for an AM FM radio to be activated because around the world most people use that. And I always reference that in South Korea most cell phones they use for exactly what you're describing live television so people can get their golf scores and I guess I guess it's baseball and golf over there. And so there seems to be a huge place for broadcast television to still exist but it, it has to exist within the biosphere of whatever system you're using, Android, iTunes, whatever you choose as a consumer, and to have a system, essentially what they're describing is outside that system. You know, you go onto your TV, you hit aux, and now you're the way it used to be. I mean, of course that would work, but it, I think we're saying the same thing. Have, yeah, you been, have you seen anything recently with all your, your the streaming you've been doing, or are you still just watching the sports? No, no, I'm, I'm doing, I mean, I do a lot of YouTube. I, I save things to watch later. I love TED Talks and, you know, information and stuff about technology that I can't, can't isn't even available on cable. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the big picture, I think, if we want to zoom back a little bit, and this is where, you know, the, I, you know, I think that the cable vision thing is really kind of a joke, is that it's, you know, it's, I've been talking about this stuff, as you guys may or may not know, with videography columns that go back decades. And I have for 12 years, I wrote a column called The Video Web. And, you know, where we're heading is exactly what's happened to the music business. You know, and if you look at Pandora or you look at Spotify and the fact that everything's available on streaming, we're, and HBO has now had to make its product to make its streaming available as a standalone, which I've been predicting for a long time, basically everything is going to have to be available also on the Internet. And, you know, it, it, with the Masters was a great example for me as a golf fan because Augusta National controls the rights. They were streaming the golf tournament live on the Internet. All you needed was the app. You know, there was commercials on it, but you could watch the golf tournament quite good quality on an iPad, for example, without any TV network, without any cable. It was directly via the Masters app. And, and that's an example of where we're going that the NBA will have its own app and you'll be able to subscribe directly with the NBA the way you can now describe directly with HBO down the line. And, and the cable systems, the faster they can get to the fact that they're obsolete. We, you know, we're, it's not overnight, this is going to take years, but we're, that's where we're transitioning to that it's the bottom, peop, consumers can get what they want, when they want it, wherever they want it. And, and that's what broadcasters or video producers, whoever you're talking about, has to provide. And, you know, Napster was the call that went out to the music industry. They fought it tooth and nail. And, you know, at the end of the day, they lost. The same thing will happen with TV and video, no doubt, in my mind anyway. Yeah. Uh, so what about you, Chris? Have you been watching anything interesting <laughs> over there? You know, I... Don't think I talked about it on the show. Actually, I was a diehard cable news guy for uh, years, and I just got sick of it. Uh, I was just wanted to kind of block out all the noise in my life and focus on things that were important. And was always interested in technology and that type of thing. So I started watching this uh, Twit TV network, which was podcasting network, which is now video, and they run programming 24/7. It's it's repeats and whatnot, but they also run live feeds and they show in between the shows and whatnot, uh, and I've been watching that like like a, a lunatic uh, all the time because they have so many shows, uh, but also trying to find YouTube shows that I could subscribe to that are delivered on a regular basis. Um, and but it is interesting when you mention the Twit Network that you mentioned the live angle to it. It seems that with any any of these future networks, be it if Netflix tries to really go head-to-head -head with a network or if Hulu or if one of them... Wait, really I have to interrupt to... you. What do you mean tries? Well, I mean try. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, no, and I will get to the point is I say tries because what they don't have is that personal connection that something like a news anchor provides or the reason we love sports is because it is live. I do think that they're... 
if you're going to be providing streaming video, and the way you're describing, I think everybody agrees, it's going to be on demand and on the internet and in your pocket on a phone. But there does need to be a level of curation that it seems that the networks have always understood. It's why the view has always succeeded. They're not giving you a huge amount of production value, but they're giving you a personal connection with a celebrity. And so it seems like, yeah, they're, if they are going to break out, It'll be interesting if they try to do it just with a prepackaged movie model or, you know, you look at MTV and they're not just giving you uh, videos nowadays. There's all kinds of, you know, interruptions and I don't watch their day-to-day -day broadcasting, but they certainly have personalities that are developed. And it seems like Netflix, they're giving you content in the form of shows, but other than the Chelsea Handler show, which... I think is still on and comes out daily. They haven't had too many daily released shows that are right. time specific. So there, there were, there were your. I mean, in this, I think we're going to get. There's apples and oranges and pears and apricots and a whole lots of different kinds of fruit here. Netflix is going directly after HBO. Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, said HBO and us is like the Red Sox and the Yankees. And you don't have to be a sports fan to get that analogy. Um, you know, they're doing, I forget the number now, 320 hours of original programming this year. You know, Amazon Prime won the Emmy for um, Transparent. Brilliant show, original production. And so they're going into high, you know, like movie of the week level is what, uh, what you'd say. I mean, you know, I'm a big fan of House of Cards, and Kevin Spacey is my connection to Netflix, if you will. I mean, the guy's brilliant. The series is brilliant. I love it. And I, you know, I'm a network. You know, I, I'm ready to turn off HBO because Newsroom isn't on anymore. That was my favorite show. But for a lot of people, it's Game of Thrones is what's keeping them hooked to HBO. So it isn't. That's a different level of entertainment production versus your live news, live talk. Um, you know, there are many YouTube personalities that are, you know, really doing an interesting job. A couple that I watch on the kind of creative services level. I love Trey Radcliffe. Um, who's a digital photographer that does HDR, high dynamic range photography. He does Google Hangouts live globally with di great photographers, and they talk about all kinds of digital photography subjects. Thousands of people are tuning in. I think um, that's, that's an amazing phenomenon, too, because I was starting to, uh, like I said, watch these YouTube uh, subscription channels, and there's this guy that does this retro video game show and all of a sudden I got a notification either via Twitter or uh, the YouTube app saying that he was doing this live hangout and all this guy was doing was playing this retro video game but there was a chat room there and he was able to answer questions about what he does and whatnot and there's such a feeling of community with that even if it's something as small if you will as a, as a chat room and not, you know, talking heads being able to talk like we are. Uh, but that interaction is great. And what Phil was talking about, that Twit network, is they have a chat room too, and they're actually monitoring it all the time. The hosts always have it up, so they're able to react. Uh, but also, too, they have this... When the, Before the show starts, they just roll the cameras the whole time. After it's done, they roll them the whole time. And to have that behind the scenes... Uh, you really feel like you're part of something, and uh, I think the Google Hangouts, you know, even though Google Plus hasn't been updated in like a year, uh, I, you know, I, I hope that they don't get rid of that, and I hope the live on air start to expand because it's nice to see people participate. Uh, you know, just your regular Joe. You know, this is giving us the opportunity for not just the media elite to be able to communicate to uh, everybody in video format, I think. Oh, there's so much of that happening. I mean, I'm trying to remember, I was just trying to Google the that huge game network. There's a whole video network about playing video games. Oh, I, yeah, I, I know I know what you're uh, talking just about. Just got sold for like a billion dollars. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, Twitch, Twitch, I believe. Twitch, yeah. So, so there's an example of highly interactive, and it's all you know on on a particular subject. Another guy I really like happens to be a photographer, but it's really more about creativity. Is Chase Jarvis, who um, interviewed one of my favorite authors, Brene Brown, for example, has also been on Oprah and lots of different places. Um, she taught. She has a very famous vulnerability. The the power of vulnerability is a famous TED talk that 
I, I love. But anyway, he did a great interview with her, fully produced. He's, he's a high-end kind of like fashion advertising photographer, and he produces this video show that is absolutely broadcast quality. In fact, I would say it's better produced than things like The View. <laughs> well, I, I know, but I, I, you hit it right on the head. You said you used the term broadcast. I guess that's the distinction we're making, right? There, there's always been broadcast television traditionally, you know, the networks, what we think of. And then HBO, and I guess what Netflix is going after, carved out this very high production value, quasi, you know, almost a third form. Is it really television? Is it a movie? But it does seem that there's this real empty space for, and I'll say it frankly, the professionals, you know, the networks, to be providing on-air talent through these mediums. I mean, I'm just surprised that with all the production value at the networks that they're not posting more videos on YouTube. I mean, and, and that's just a, a creative choice they've made. Well, so, you know, where, where I think there's a, it's not, not so much a creative choice. I think it's a a short short minded short sighted kind of choice similar to what I was saying before about Napster um, in that you, if you look at somebody that I think does a good job of getting their stuff out there is Comedy Central you know I can watch John Stewart clips I was actually just looking at an Amy Schumer clip earlier today you know very funny stuff right off their broadcast but they're breaking it down into clips and making it available on YouTube you don't have to be on the cable network watching the show it's aftermarket I suppose but, yeah. But, me meanwhile, you have. Out. Sorry, sorry. Go on. Go on. No, go on. I'm right. No, I'm saying. Go. Meanwhile, you have uh, ESPN is suing Verizon now on the East Coast to try to stop basically some real uh, shakeups in the cable world with this really small packaging of just sports for ten dollars, and all you get is sports. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's. I mean, there's always some sort of pushback. Like you said, where Napster may have been ahead of their time and the industry was able to shut it down then, but in the long run, the the genie's out of the bottle. So right, and I, you know, I think you're absolutely right. That that those are the short-sighted actions that I'm talking about. That at the end of the day, it's all going to change. I mean, it's just there won't be any keeping that genie in the bottle, or as I like to say, the toothpaste isn't going back in the tube. You know, it's it, these changes are not going away. And it's, you know, part of the, you know, I think Netflix is, is a brilliant example of the way they pivoted. When they, you know, they were a DVD delivery system, and we all remember and sometimes still see those red envelopes. But they, Reed Hastings saw streaming coming. And he, he went all in with streaming. And, you know, now we don't even remember the DVDs barely. You know, because they're a streaming company, and they, they made that move. And, you know, why the likes of NBC, you know, I mean, HBO is now playing catch-up, you know, it was predictable from my point of view, but there's just no going back from the fact that HBO, ESPN, whoever, they're going to be dealing directly with the consumer. And, and you know, we're going to be able to license that stuff by any device we want someday soon. The only question is who and when and whether some other sports network can come along and kick ESPN's butt by making the games more available but you know they do sign exclusive contracts and all that kind of stuff so it's interesting but the masters example I think is you know underscoring what I'm saying that it it can go independent when the when when they want it to so John you've been saying that there's a different baskets of programming can you explain that a little bit more yeah and actually I think it's bigger than most people realize and when you bring YouTube into it for example we used to talk about user generated content Right, and I, I'm now starting to use the term peer-to-peer -peer video, where it isn't really broadcasting designed to be a big commercial enterprise, but you know, one of the biggest developments that's happened with video on the web in the last few weeks is the live streaming. Uh, Meerkat originally, and now Twitter's taken over with their own app called Periscope, where literally with, it, with a smartphone, you can live stream, and there are ESPN is now bringing it onto the set. I was looking at a Periscope the other night, uh, a live stream on the set of Sports Center while they were doing Sports Center, the sportscasters in commercials were were talking to the live audience that was watching via cell phones on Periscope, and that's just another example like Vine on Twitter, like Instagram Video, where more and and then all those YouTube videos that we've seen for a long time now. It seems like a long time where there's a whole other slew of content. 
that um, people are watching and paying attention, which is part of the video consumption universe in a very big and rapidly expanding way. And so you have to put that into the mix too. Yeah, no, I've thought about that in so much as working in the news world for the last maybe three, four years, there's been a product live view, and you'll see it tagged sometimes. And it's essentially five cell phones bundled together, which gives you enough bandwidth for a broadcast quality station to get a shot out. And I've always thought all they need is a little more bandwidth, and once you can do it with one phone, then everybody can do it. And it's, it seems like the, those days are, are coming pretty soon. Well, they're here with Periscope. Yeah. I mean, you know, Periscope and Meerkat are doing that. You know, and a friend of mine does a golf podcast. He was doing, uh, I forget what he was doing. He was, you know, he was doing one of the interviews for his show. While he was doing the interview, he set up a Periscope broad, or whatever you want to call it, live stream, and had a couple hundred people watching him do the interview on a whole other channel that didn't used to exist. So, and this is a guy with a radio background that does it. Fred Green, it's called Golf Smarter. Might as well give him a plug. But yeah, this, this stuff, and that, this stuff is a, like two weeks old or something. I mean, you know, those apps have just gained visibility and have taken off, taken off like wildfire. Yeah, and, and they're the newest, hippest thing, and then, you know, everything settles and then something old becomes new again. I mean, you well, could have said that about YouTube, though, couldn't you? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it well, hasn't settled. As we, uh, as we wrap up here, John, um, what are you working on these days? Well, a bunch of different stuff. Um, I'm one of the things that uh, I'm working. You know, I do a lot of websites and internet marketing, uh, as well as video production. And and in the world of websites, I've been really standardized on WordPress websites. And I'm now actually transitioning, in a large extent, for small businesses over to Squarespace, and doing it in a collaborative way. I call it one-on-one, -on -one, get it done. And so people literally come into my office or I can do it by Hangouts or Skype and do a website with them or most of a website in just three hours or so. Um, and it's really kind of fun. A new, it, it reminds me of being in a post-production suite back in the, in the TV days because you sit with the client, you talk about what you're going to do, and you just get it done. Um, so it's faster and less expensive. And, you know, that's one of the things I'm doing. And I, I'm going to be doing a course. I'm big into online education, and I love sharing information. So I'm, I'm getting into this platform called Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y.com, that enables anyone basically to author a course. So the first one, I think, is going to be on how to do a Squarespace website, um, but much more to come in that arena as well. Yeah, nobody does a client edit anymore. Uh, so, so there you go. And it's so funny because uh, you know, you it's like you pulled away the veil because the whole thing with with web web development, uh, you know, and web design is you know was all this magic that was happening. But you know, there there goes the the emperor has no clothes. No, it, 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 you're fine with it because this is the new world. You could sit there with the client. The client could do it themselves if they had the time. But you know, who, well, I'm, and I'm trying to, you know, it's easier for them to make changes and easier for them to make updates and they learn from watching me while we do it and they can continue or not, but I'm happy to help people do a website and they're off and running and that's happened already. You know, but it's interesting that you say you do it over it. video because it seems like video is becoming a new form of literacy. I mean, just like any other form of communication, Agreed. if you show up and you're in your bathrobe and you try to do that, people are going to look at you a scant next time they see you in the real world. You know, it seems like they like any sort of new form of communication. That sometimes people have a hard time wrapping their brains around. It still is a form that, in a professional setting, has to be dealt with professionally. I'm always surprised how often I've gotten uh, emojis in situations where they just they don't seem really appropriate for whatever business we're talking about at the time. But I, I think you're very right. I mean, media literacy is a whole big subject, but within the context of the work that I'm doing, my ability to use Google Hangouts, and I, I do screen sharing so they don't see that I'm in my pajamas, by the way, so it's more like I'm talking to them and showing them what I'm doing, you know, in this case, the Squarespace interface, here's where it goes. And that, you know, and that carries over to things like Camtasia, uh, screen. So this one of my clients that I did a website for, he said, I forgot how to add a graphic. And what we decided was the best thing for him is I just, I did a little Camtasia screen grab. I made him a little five-minute movie showing him how to do it, posted it up, and, you know, and he, like, had a private training video, and I did the whole thing in, like, 15 minutes. It's a, you know it's very efficient, but that's a kind of literacy. It's my skill set. Not everybody can do that because not everybody learns how to use those applications. 
Well, especially uh, websites in, in your jammies. I'm hosting this show, No Pants. Phil, could TD a show? I can guarantee <laughs> I, I, I am only time. wearing shorts. Uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, right. I'm, I'm not standing up either. Yeah. So, so, John, how can people uh, get a hold of you? Well, I'm, I'm on on Twitter and, and other places. I'm John Combridges. I guess Twitter and, and uh, uh, Instagram is J-O-N. I like to say I'm H-less. And then C-O-M is in Mary, B-R-I-D-G-E-S. And combridges.com, that's my main website. There's a contact form there uh, and my 888 number. I'm also John Combridges on Skype. So that's the, those are the coordinates, as they say. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, and this wraps it up for this episode of Mediaographer Online. For Phil Capello, I'm Christopher Michael McHugh.